Well, what can one say about the Good Samaritan, the parable of the Good Samaritan, that hasn't been already said? It's one of the most famous and most quoted of all the parables of Jesus. Well, it turns out that among the awful recent events, more racial tension around law enforcement, more gun violence, more death, more useless, counterproductive, and divisive nattering, ideological and otherwise, from some of our media and political classes, this story of a man left for dead and the unlikely one who helps him has a lot to say to us today. The problem is, though, is that the, quote, good Samaritan has become something of a secularized saint, and our modern usage bears precious little resemblance to the brave and surprising character that Jesus introduces. Nowadays, a good Samaritan is someone who is just helpful, even kindly. Someone who helps a little old lady across the street, volunteers for a worthy cause, that sort of thing. And there's nothing wrong with all of those things. But taking him out of his context and sanitizing him as merely a do-gooder takes a revolutionary, jarring, and for many, frightening and challenging story and turns turns it into mush. So let's look to see how we might rescue this Samaritan from our niceness and discover how this can speak to us today in the midst of our own common troubles. Now the lawyer questioning Jesus asks a fairly abstract question about eternal life and Jesus directs him immediately to the Torah. This law professional gives the right answer. But then he gets some pretty down-to-earth advice. Yes, love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Do this and live. Now, when he asks a second question, wanting to justify himself, and we don't really know exactly what that means. It could be a lot of things. He asks a very legitimate question. And who is my neighbor? Now, this would have been hotly described by the scribes of Jesus' time, since the original command to love one's neighbor in Leviticus specifies your kin, your people, your family, your group. But typically, instead of just a straight answer, this lawyer gets a story from Jesus. And there are several things in this story that really need some clarifying for us. First, it's inappropriate to turn the holy men, the priest and the Levite, who ignore the beaten man into hypocrites and hard hearts. We are told the victim in the ditch is half dead and probably looks it. And priests were forbidden from going near to a dead body, even their own parent. The priest and Levite simply represent the traditional ways religious figures would have acted in such circumstances. And probably everyone listening to Jesus would have known that. The Samaritan on the other hand, was truly a race despised in that culture. Despised. Everyone listening would have known this too. And no doubt, probably some were angry that this guy was the hero of the story. Remember, James and John just recently wanted to burn a Samaritan village to the ground because they wouldn't accept and welcome Jesus. Samaritans were considered dirty of mixed race who rejected the restoration of Jerusalem and even helped Syria in conflicts with the Jews. It was a Jewish high priest that helped destroy the Samaritan temple. Jesus' choice of the Samaritan, persona non grata in Israel, total outcast, outsider, as the guy on the road to Jericho who helps the beaten Jewish man is just staggering, unthinkable. And this is exactly where the story gathers its force. By naming this unacceptable, despised foreigner as the person who displays all of the full characteristics of a neighbor, in one stroke, Jesus completely wipes away all of the limitations and the parochial considerations that the command of Leviticus might suggest. It's not just your kin. It's not just your people. It's God's kin. It's God's people. And that means everyone. God will not be limited by the petty hatreds and artificial divisions that are part of the central sinfulness of human beings. Missing the mark. 
deep-seated hatreds between individuals, races, and nations that have become an accepted way of life are wiped away in this story. And maybe most importantly, its, its greatest impact is how this parable might encourage us to flip the narrative, flip the perspective, to identify with the victim in the ditch, not being the favored ones who help the less fortunate, but all of us being desperately in need of the mercy and kindness of others, including especially maybe the outsiders, those we think of as the enemy. Maybe finally we can even recognize the Samaritan as Christ himself, the holy and unexpected healer who encounters, has compassion for, and restores the broken person who all the religious figures ignore, have forgotten. Rather, in this case, than being a secularized saint, the Samaritan symbolizes the divine prophet. Now we're getting somewhere with this story. Now you and I gather today for worship in a week filled, and not for the first time, with terrible violence in our country. We are shocked by horrifying and tragic pictures, narratives, and videos of shootings in Baton Rouge, Falcon Heights, and Dallas. But just substitute those names for other things that have happened in the recent past. We are heartbroken again for all the victims of violence. Our hearts and minds are heavy, and we are filled with many questions. Why does this kind of violence and destruction continue to happen over and over and over again? innocent lives being threatened and destroyed at the hands of violence and hate. And what and who can help heal these wounds and make it stop? Sounds a lot like the issues raised in our parable today, doesn't it? A few weeks ago you heard me tell the story of Kesia Thomas. She was a black high school student who about 20 years ago risked, risked her own life to protect a white Klansman who was being attacked by anti-neo-Nazi protesters at a KKK rally. She literally shielded his body with hers, receiving the blows meant for him. And as people were doing this, she shouted, and, and as people were shouting, kill the Nazi, kill the Nazi, she screamed back, you can't beat goodness into a person. The story just rings in my ears as I watch the recent tragedies unfold. And here's what I want to say to you all, my beloved sisters and brothers at St. Martin's. As the parable clearly demonstrates in Jesus' time and is in any headline in ours, demonstrates. A consistent theme in human society is its unfortunate tendency toward ignorance, hatred, and brutality. Out there in the world, there will always, always, always be those who will enact violence and injustice and those who will either ignore it or even encourage it. There have been and always will be those who want to use those things and divide human beings to further their own twisted agendas and reasons. But the one thing I do know is that that's not us. However we understand these toxic issues or what actions we undertake to remedy them, to remedy them we are incontrovertibly called to be voices for peace, for reconciliation, healing, and yes, love. The first thing the Samaritan did upon encountering the beaten man was to listen to him, have pity upon him. And the first thing the half-dead man did was to trust, trust, trust this despised Samaritan. And there was healing between them. Now, we are rightly aghast at this senseless violence. But remember, we are here because we follow a man who was literally viciously murdered in front of his own mother. And out of that death came new life. That is the very heart of the gospel. That from death can and does come new life. That is God's promise to us if we are faithful to God. I came across a message written uh, the other day after Dallas by a guy that I actually went to seminary with, Peter Gray. I haven't seen him in years, but it really touched me and strengthened me and helped me get straight about what's happening among, among us and who I am as a Christian in the midst of it. 
He wrote, Shocked by pictures and video from Dallas, Falcon Heights, and Baton Rouge, I'm aware that Sunday we'll hear a lawyer ask Jesus the question, Who is my neighbor? And hear Jesus tell a parable about a Samaritan healing one who could have been his enemy. The story says that all people are our neighbors. It says we're to surprise the world by loving when the world expects us to hate and live in fear. The story says we might be surprised at whose hands reach out to us in mercy, by which people are the means of God's salvation. There will be many voices in short through the coming days in our TVs, in our homes, in our own conflicted hearts. But be clear, any voice that encourages hate is contrary to the gospel. Any voice that dehumanizes a child of God is contrary to the gospel. Any voice that justifies violence against a neighbor doesn't know a thing about the gospel. So don't listen to them and be one of the voices that tells a better story. End quote. I hope in the quiet of your hearts and around your dinner tables and at your jobs and to anyone who listens that you tell the story of hope of reconciliation and, yes, love that can come out of such horrifying conflict where we are called to be better, bigger, and more loving than the circumstances in which we find ourselves. I hope you tell the story of Jesus. I want to end today with a prayer just sent out jointly by our, our, our outgoing Bishop Dan and our soon-to-be-consecrated new Bishop Dan. It's going to be easy to remember this bishop's name. Let us pray. Most loving God, source of all peace, we, your servants, live in a world divided and enslaved by division, suffering, and hatred. And you have entrusted your mission of healing and reconciliation to our hands. Give us strength to bind up the wounds of division. Give us courage to be strong reconcilers. Endow us with the energy to bridge the chasms that inhabit all parts of our nation. Your blessed Son died and rose again to implant in our hearts your divine vision of love, reconciliation, peace, and community. Strengthen us to be ever bolder witnesses to the mission you have entrusted to us. As followers of Jesus, let us so love, plant peace, build reconciliation, and grow community in our world. This we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.